Hello and welcome to Nevermind the Bar Charts with myself, Mark Pack. We're heading across the Atlantic this time to talk about US politics. And for that, I'm joined by a US politics podcaster, Karen Robinson of the Democratically 2020 show. Welcome, Karen. Hello, Mark. Great to be on. And it feels like a nice return favour after you kindly invited me on your show to talk about my book, Bad News. Uh, well, I day. thoroughly enjoyed talking to you about that. And it was uh, very on point with a lot of my election related anxiety. So it's always good to talk about the media. Yeah, I, yes, I hope the title Bad News isn't able to double up with the description of the result of the US presidential election. Fingers <laughs> um, crossed. So let's jump straight in. And I slightly fear what your answer to this question might be. But is Donald Trump going to win? You're just kind of going straight into it, yeah. aren't you? Um, <laughs> I'm hiding behind the sofa. <laughs> so I have a I have a bit of a shit sandwich answer for mm. that, which is a good news, bad news, good news again mm. story. Um, so the good news is, and and I, I I think we're all slightly traumatized by the outcome of the 2016 election. So I really have to reinforce mm. this good news piece first of all. Um, we have every reason to believe that. That, that Joe Biden is in a very good position uh, to win the election, both in terms of the popular vote and indeed the Electoral College, um, which we failed to do in 2016. Um, first of all, bear in mind that Donald Trump only won in 2016 by about 100,000 votes distributed across, very carefully across three Midwestern states. Um, all three of those states are looking more favorable for uh, Democrats this year than they did in 2016. Michigan and Wisconsin in particular are looking particularly strong. Pennsylvania may be a little bit less so, um, but so we're keeping a close eye on that one. But we are in those critical swing states in a very good condition. Um, it is also worth, so there's lots of other reasons why Biden is in a better shape than Hillary Clinton it was in 2016. One important reason, which I think is a little bit under discussed, is that um, although Hillary Clinton was also ahead in the uh, in the national polls at this time in the last election cycle, she wasn't ahead by as much, A, but B, the number of undecided voters in that election was much higher. There are mm. simply not enough, there are not that many voters left for Donald Trump to win over. Um, which means that in order to um, reclaim some kind of a majority, he would need to not just win undecided, but actually take voters away from Joe Biden. Yeah. And, and just on that, it's just worth adding for any listeners who are used to looking at both US and British political opinion polls. There's a key difference, isn't there, in how the polls in the two countries are reported. So in the UK, we're used to the don't knows being removed from the headline figures. So that's why when you add up Labour, Tory, Green, Lib Dem, SNP, etc, it comes to 100 or 99 or 101, but basically yeah. comes to 100%. In the US, the don't knows are not removed. Yeah. Um, so the polls that show typically Biden on, you know, close to or, or just above 50%, actually because that's still got the don't knows left in that's a very decent that's a genuine election majority. winning share isn't it yeah yeah exactly so hillary clinton never was over 50 percent in the average of polls in in 2016 um so that's the good news and we have plenty of reasons for optimism there i can go through it state by state yeah. there are states that we didn't win in 2016 or didn't come close to winning where we're doing really well now like arizona there's lots of reasons to feel really positive i'll um, just add maybe one other one other yeah. reason for positivity before we get to the the grimmer news <laughs> um because i was having a look at this recently the financial times did a really good piece on how now the pollsters are adjusting for education now. So one of the things that seems to have gone wrong with the polls in 2016 was that the pollsters don't generally wait for years of education. They wait for things like age and gender and ethnicity, but not for education. And they ended up with samples that were basically on average too heavily educated yeah. last yeah. time and therefore they skewed Democrat. And so when we're comparing the polls this time with last time, these are polls that this time have been adjusted to allow for that. And so the fact that Biden is better in the polls, even after those adjustments, is yeah. good news for him. And in fact, if you remove the weighting by education, so you, in that sense, you're comparing like for like, albeit flawed with flawed, mm -hmm. uh, then Biden's lead is even higher compared to Clinton's, you know, at this time, last time. So there's there's definite positive news, but bring us now crashing down to earth and reasons to get behind that right. sofa and scared. Right. So the, the, the crashing to, so you're completely correct about all of that. We've got every reason to be optimistic. The, the, the kind of shit in the middle of the sandwich, if you'll excuse my expression, is 
although I believe Joe Biden is going to win the election, it may nevertheless be the case that Donald Trump may remain president in 20... In, in 20 <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and what I mean by that is a number of things. First of all, um, there is a lingering electoral college to popular vote um, disjunction, and that disjunction is probably going to be bigger this year than it was in 2016. Um, in 2016, obviously, Hillary Clinton won more votes to the tune of about 2%. It could be as much as 5% this year. Um, uh, the difference between uh, the difference between the Electoral College and the um, and the and the popular vote um, for a number of reasons, one of which is good news for us. Democrats are doing better in red states. We're performing really well in red states like Georgia and Texas that we may not actually win, but that's a lot of voters that we're winning that we don't get any quote unquote credit for. Yeah. So there is that problem remains. Then you have the the slightly more serious problem and the the problem that I think everybody is having sleepless nights about, that we have a president who is openly contemptuous of the democratic process and has been not so subtly hinting and openly stating that he intends to use the power of the presidency to remain in power through a wide range of, of different non-democratic mechanisms. One in particular that I think we should be concerned about is the, the disconnection between um, so the, the actual voting methodology, because this is going to be an unprecedented election in terms of how people will vote. Um, now, vote by mail is not new to American elections. There are, I think, six states that are completely vote by mail and have been for years anyway. But in almost every state in the country, we're seeing extraordinary proportions of the votes that voters say that they intend to vote by mail for reasons of COVID security, um, you know, and also because the election is uncertain, unstable, people are very eager to get their votes in. So we've and, already and just seen on it, that. The, yeah. I mean, it's always dangerous to judge a country by what you see in the news. But yeah. obviously, one of the staples we see in the UK at US election time is people queuing for hours and hours that polling genuinely does take very often a lot longer than it does here in the UK doesn't it and therefore if you're worried about coronavirus actually me popping out to my local polling station here wouldn't feel like a big deal yeah. but popping out somewhere and having to stand in a queue for several hours is a much much riskier proposition isn't it yeah, I'm I'm sorry to have to say to you, Mark, that I suspect you would probably be fine if you were in America popping out to your local polling station, as would <laughs> middle I. Middle class white, man, yeah. Middle class white voters would probably be fine. Um, but it is nevertheless true that in that there that there has been a concerted effort um to make voting reduce the number of polling places available for specifically minority communities and also in places like college campuses which are not necessarily mm. minority voters but where you'd expect the voters to skew democratic and yeah. that's that, that which is fantastic like the republicans argument for why they're not being racially biased by trying to suppress the black vote is we're not we're not oppressing them because they're dem because they're black we're oppressing them because they're democrats um, that is the kind of legal justification for that kind of voter suppression. So voter suppression is a problem. Um, Trump has gone beyond even traditional vote, Republican voter suppression to suggest that he might intervene in other ways. Um, and now you have in the vote by mail, just as one, for instance, um, there did not used to be any significant statistical difference between whether Republicans or Democrats vote by mail. Mm. They, they used to say that they would be likely to vote by mail in roughly equal proportions. But for this election, there is a huge disparity between people who say that they will vote by mail and people who say that they will vote in person, skewing very much towards most Democrats saying that they're going to vote by mail. That has huge problems for election night. Um, and I think I want your listeners to be bracing themselves for this right now and getting their heads around it. Most likely we will not have an electoral outcome on election night, not because there isn't an over, there might even be an overwhelming majority for Joe Biden, but bear in mind that in many of the swing states, there's actually legislation that states you cannot count mail ballots until, uh, until election day or thereafter, which means that the early counts are likely to skew strongly Republican and, and, Trump is banking on that. He's banking on that as a messaging framework. He's banking on that, um, getting an early lead and then trying to find whatever way he can to stop the vote, um, distract people from the vote counting, suggesting that the votes um, that are coming in by mail are illegitimate. He's been demonizing the mail-in vote for a long time. So 
Um, there's are, there are plenty of reasons to be concerned that this election will not be free and fair. And that's a horrible thing to say. And in terms of that skew in the postal votes, what do you think has caused it? I mean, my assumption is that it's generally people who are more concerned about coronavirus are more likely to yeah. have applied, you know, think I should get a postal vote. I, yeah, better to uh, either vote early or, you know, vote from the security and safety of, of your own home. And in the US, there does seem to be a very strong partisan divide over taking coronavirus seriously or not in a way that we don't really have. We have a bit of that in Britain, but not really. Um, you know, Don Dominic Cummings aside, <laughs> there's, there's not been that much partisanship to, 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 to a lot of the debate in the UK compared to the US. Um, it, is it that or is there some other demographic or political factor at work? Um, so yeah, it is. It is that. Um, it's also. I think you have to look at. You have to bear in mind the strength of not just partisanship, but President Trump's unique role within mm. the Republican Party. Um, the Republican Party. Remember, they didn't have a platform in this year's Republican Party convention. Their platform was just. They. They just said we support President Trump and his agenda. Right. President Trump hasn't hasn't announced an agenda. So basically, it has become largely a cult of personality backing what President Trump says. It's, you know, it's, it's demagoguery. And President Trump has spent the past six months trying to persuade people that there is some kind of, um, some kind of problem with mail-in voting. He's been trying to conflate it with fraud, suggest that it's insecure, et cetera. None of that, by the way, I should say, there is absolutely no evidence for any of this. It's complete crap. I mean, there's nothing to it. Um, you know, President Trump himself votes by mail. Um, and he's trying to say that there's some difference between absentee voting, which he does, and mail-in voting, which everyone else is doing. But that's just nonsense. There is no, there is, the categories are the same. Like there is no linguistic difference between them. There is no structural difference between them. So he's been trying to signal to his voters that mail voting is illegitimate and, and actively trying to suppress the, the vote by mail. Um, now, it could redound very much to his disadvantage. Um, you know, if we do get a resurgence of poll of, of coronavirus, as is likely around that time, um, he may find that his voters are unable to cast their ballots, mm -hmm. in which case, you know, on his head be it. <laughs> but, uh, um, but, you know, we have to be prepared for the eventuality of an election night in which it looks like, um, it, and I think, it, and, and I think, you know, to your, to your point from your book about the media, I mm -hmm. think the media need to start preparing now for how they will cover mm -hmm election night and they need to start preparing their viewers and listeners and readers um, that you know it, it is it, it would probably be irresponsible for them to report election day outcomes mm. um, except to the extent that they've been able to to take a reasonable sampling of the absentee ballots because um, mail-in ballots are going to be 50 in many states mail-in ballots look like they might be 50 to 60 percent of the vote this year um, but Trump is going to try and claim victory on the basis of, of, of day voting. And, and I guess one thing that will make it easier for him to try and claim victory is the thing I've been really struck by when watching uh, US election night coverage is that firstly, um, exit polls have had a much more hit and miss record in the US than in the UK. And I think that's not just sort of British chauvinism. I've been digging into this for the next book I'm writing at the <laughs> moment. I think it is fair to say that the US exit polls have had a bit of a hit and miss record. And partly as a result of that, US election coverage really focuses in the early hours on raw vote totals mm -hmm. and not even giving you the change in raw vote totals compared to last time. And so, you, you, you know, you, you discover that there is some bit of some state that has got huge numbers of Republican votes coming in and the sort of statistical context that you need, which is, well, how Republican was it last time? Is that percentage share up or down, et cetera, tends to be um, missing until much, you know, once you get deeper into the election results, there's all sorts of brilliant statistical analysis. And, you know, actually, frankly, if you look at some of the US coverage at that point, it makes some of the British coverage look really simplistic by comparison. But in the early stages, yeah where there's just the focus on the raw vote numbers if as you say those are heavily skewed republican because they've not got postal votes in there and so on it, it's easy to see how people could get a really bad impression yeah. a misleading impression of what it, what's actually happening it, 
It absolutely is. And it's, it's, it's even leaving aside, you know, specific vote tunnels. I think um, it's also when the vote comes in from which place. I think mm. anybody who's followed an American election night, as I have many, many times from the wee small hours of the morning from my London house, um, will know it quite often, the early um, reporting is often very Republican skewed anyway, because small rural counties tend to report their vote before the big urban centers. And I think most of us have, have had the experience of, you know, waiting up till three or four a.m. for, you know, Pennsylvania, you know, Philadelphia and, and Pittsburgh to report, because so far all you've had from Pennsylvania is the rural counties. Uh, I, I would give you the example of in 2018, Kristen Cinema was running um, as the Democrat in Arizona. And on election night, it looked very unclear who would the winner would be, um, even though in the end she won by about 2.5%. So it was not that close, but the election night returns were, were inconclusive and uh, you know the, the media felt uncomfortable calling it quite rightly. Um, so I think we just need to start getting into people's heads that if it is inconclusive in election night, that may not even mean that it's close. It, it, may, it certainly doesn't mean that Trump has run. It doesn't even necessarily mean that the election is tight. It just means that the process needs to play out. Yeah. And again, there's a, a contrast with British politics there in that because of the different ways in which the election counts are done, as you say, in the US, you get the rural and hence tends to be more right leaning votes in first. In Britain, it's the exact opposite. You get the more compact urban areas declaring results first. And so that's why, you know, classically in Britain, the first few seats that are declared are all Labour and act, and the interest is really in the in yeah. the vote share rather than the winner. Um, you know, even even in 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 catastrophic election nights for Labour, you know, if the the, the initial seat count looks quite good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and and I guess one other element uh, of of difference is this point about when postal votes get counted. So in Britain, the deadline for returning a postal vote is 10 p.m uh you know on polling day so you have to get your postal vote back by then um and as you said as you touched on in terms of counting in britain some of the counting starts sooner mm -hmm. but even if the counting doesn't start before 10 p.m you've got all of the ba the ballots together and 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 the count can proceed in australia by contrast the deadline for posting your postal vote is the close of polls so the postal vote can arrive with the returning officer up to several days after the close of polls and will still be valid and in yeah. a way it's quite a logical idea that the deadline you know the deadline for voting in person is you have to vote by a certain time so you can see the logic of saying the deadline for posting your postal ballot is yeah you know, close the polls well, um, well then you get into and, and america is more like australia is that right so there isn't an America is like in this because, um, and this is this is one of the things where I, it's really hard to, people are always shocked when I point out, America doesn't have a federal voting system. Each state makes their own voting system. Um, and so each state, different states have different laws and different rules, which is why you'll see a whole raft of lawsuits aimed at state, state rules on this. So different states have different rules. Some states have rules, um, that say your ballot, as you were as you were alluding to, has to be has to be ar arrive, be physically with the the returning officer by the close of by the close of election day. Some states say that your ballot has to be postmarked or in some way con confirmed to be sent by that day, but can be returned up to X number of days after the election. And the number of days after the election can, ranges as high as some states have have rules that say up to 10, 10 15 days after the election. So it can be quite significant. Um, obviously, one of the things that's been going on in the background of this election and that's been um, causing a lot of, uh, well, concern, fear, horror on the part of not just Democrats, but but many who are watching the US election and, and indeed US life, has been the uh, changes that have been made to the Postal Service under Trump's appointee, um, who has, you know, been, been caught sort of removing postal sorting machines and as a result we've heard um lots of lots of data reporting about kind of post you know the postal service slowing down but just all mail taking longer to to be delivered um we've we've come across they tried to make a change 
to the way that election mail is handled. Now, traditionally, election mail is always, so the ballots themselves are, have always been treated as first-class mail by the U.S. Postal Service. But DeJoy, this new Postal Service appointee, um, tried to change that so it was treated as second-class mail, just making it take a little bit longer for, for those ballots to come in. Now, that's been, you know, th there's been a series of court cases that's been, that that ruling has been kind of stayed by a court that says, no, you, you have to treat election ballot, you have to treat ballots as first class mail. Um, they've, they've put a halt to any further sort of destruction of, of sorting machines, but it just goes to show that wherever the Trump administration feels mm -hmm. able to find um, ways that they can intervene in the process, they seem quite comfortable doing so. And we, we have to be very yeah. alert to it. Can I just um, get super nerdy and go back to your point about the removal of post boxes? Because um, mm. I, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Politico, I, I thought had actually a really good piece about how the evidence, I think, is much more mixed in that a lot of the reporting certainly has been versions of it's outrageous that X thousand post boxes have been removed. And what the piece that I remember reading pointed out is actually lots of post boxes get removed every year because as in, you know, as in many other countries, the postal service is basically in long term decline uh, because we're all posting many fewer letters and postcards and 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 the, the thing that is keeping postal services going are parcels and parcels. You don't go to a post box generally to post. So how how much credence do you give the, the particular post box? Uh, so sort of I, allegation as it yeah were. i don't i don't think i mentioned the post box allegation particularly i was talking about the sorting machines um oh, so right. the sorting machines. Yeah. so so the difference would be obviously post boxes are obviously the things that that consumers would use to put their post in the, their mail in the post sorting machines are the uh, machinery that is used within the postal sorting office to expedite and they can i think they process something like 30,000 pieces yeah. of mail per hour so it's it's really i mean not to nerd out on the postal service yeah, please do little, please do <laughs> but it really is the u.s postal service is a miracle of 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 a service um and it is you know to, to nerd out slightly the only federal government service that is specifically mentioned in the constitution so you know big up to the postal service it was deemed by the by the founding fathers to be absolutely essential mm -hmm. to this new ex democratic experiment that they wanted to create that citizens should be able to communicate with each other across the whole of the country which is why they put the postal service in as an essential federal service even at a time when a lot of the founding fathers didn't think there should be much of a federal infrastructure at all everybody agreed the postal service was essential so on the specific point about the post boxes um i've seen contradictory information mm -hmm. either way um, I, I, you know, some, and I think you're absolutely right that one of the things that happened on social media was that people would often see a picture, see their postal post box being taken away, and take a picture of it, and of course that feels very personal to them and would be shared. Um, so we don't, know, I don't know for sure whether the post box removal program was it was an attempt to intervene in the election or or do whatever but the sorting machines piece has been confirmed it was reported by post office staff um and you know has been confirmed as you know something DeJoy did on purpose and uh that they've 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 now halted that program although you know whether we can reassemble the machines that have already been taken apart seems unlikely unfortunately I, I, I really want to now discover the NPR podcast on the history of the US Postal Service. It feels like probably <laughs> somebody has probably done a brilliant set of podcast episodes. The on Postal that, Service is yeah. absolutely brilliant. So uh, so shall I do the third in my yeah, shit get back, sandwich? Let's, let's get back to the sandwich, the final right. bit. Right. So there's the good news and the bad news. I think the final piece of, of good news is bearing all of this in mind. The good news for all of your listeners is that this is not we're not reporting on the weather here, right? We have agency in this. Um, all of us, even those of us who are, you know, such as yourself, who are not US citizens, um, we don't have to just sit back and watch what is happening. We have voices, we have opportunities to influence the election, we have opportunities to influence our friends and family. So, um, you know, for me, it's, it's, 
very tempting to fall into this kind of deer and headlights paralysis of look at all these horrible things that are happening but it's important to always remember that we have an active role to play in a participatory mm. democracy and yes it feels like the stakes are stacked against us but quite often in the past in the recent history of u.s voter suppression efforts voter suppression has actually redounded against the party that's mm. been trying to suppress usually the republicans but <laughs> but because but because what it can often do is it can generate a turnout surge from people who are just frankly furious that someone's trying to take their rights away. So I think it's really important that we look at this not as a horrible thing that is being done to us, but as a horrible thing that we have the power to influence. And so everyone who's listening to the sound of my voice, you may or may not have American friends or family, you may or may not have the right to vote yourself. But if you do know anyone who has access to, you know, a US citizen, um, who um, has the has has a right to vote? Um, please urge them to go to any American abroad, vote from abroad.org. Um, you can get an absentee ballot. There are other ways to return your ballot besides through the post. Many states accept electronic ballots in various forms, whether by email or by fax. email. Seriously, yes. you can vote by email. There are there uh, are states that accept ballots by email. Fat. I mean, if you want a conspiracy about vote rigging, surely ballot. I mean, how, how are, there must be some level of security that's done that you, you don't just sort of email in, dear returning officer, I would like to cast my vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> yours sincerely. Well, there are there are a number of levels of security that go with all postal ballots. So signature matching is one. Yeah. Um, you know, they do cross cross referencing to make sure that this person hasn't voted. You know, previously they, you know, you've got to supply, you know, information that only that voter would have, such as a social security number, etc. Um, so yeah, there are multiple layers of security, and it's worth saying, um, it's it's a really fair question because the the Republicans often try to allege, and and Trump is trying to allege that there is a security and and fraud mm -hmm. problem with with absentee ballots. Um, it's worth saying that you know there have been studies that have looked into. Um, you know, over a billion ballots cast um, by mail and by absentee and have found, I think, about 30 instances of, of attempted uh, ballot fraud in all of those cases. So it is it is a problem so negligible as to be, you know, not, doesn't show up in the statistics. Um, and that's because we do have these fail safes in place. So, um, so yeah, what I would say to, to all of our, uh, all of our listeners is, um, you know, whether you're a voter or not, um, you have, there's a lot you can do. You can speak up on social media. Certainly there are organizations, although you may not be able to donate to the campaign yourself, there are organizations out there that do good work, such as the ACLU, for example. Um, there's a guy called Mark Elias, who is running a brilliant project of, um, uh, you know, sp spearheading lawsuits to make sure that ballot access is ex as expansive as possible. Um, you know, his organization is accepting support and donations. So there are lots of ways that we can we can participate in and affect the outcome here. We don't have to just sit back and watch these things happen. And that's, it's important that we see it through that lens as something we have some control over, even though it is scary. And you mentioned the possibility of a turnout surge. Mm. Um, and one thing that may trigger that, I guess, is the news about the Supreme Court, which if we maybe come on to in a moment, but also I think it's worth highlighting, isn't it, that the possibility of a turnout surge that influences the results is much more plausible in the US than it is in UK general elections. That, you know, ahead of many UK general elections, there's talk about whether young people will vote in unprecedented numbers and so on. Um, but, it, but in the US, not only is turnout overall, if you measure it in a comparable way between the US and the UK, sort of much lower so there's genuinely more room for turnout to grow but also in the midterms a couple of years ago turnout was genuinely very high I think it was uh you know the highest for quite a quite a few rounds of midterms wasn't it so so there is reason to believe that turnout might be you know at record breaking levels this time isn't there uh, beyond yeah. the, the perennial left of center oh this time <laughs> there's going to be a slow <laughs> it feels like it's a plausible hope yeah, I mean, I think it would be, to me, it would be surprising if it were not a high turnout election. Um, but, and, and it's worth saying on both sides. I mean, I would expect yeah. Republican turnout to also be yeah. high. Oh yeah, I mean, if um, you're a Trump believer, sure, you've got yeah. really strong motivation. Yeah, if, you, if, if you believe, you know, if you believe 
the the sort of the fears about what sort of future Joe Biden would make for America. You know, those are pretty motivating as well, aren't they, on the yeah. other side? Yeah. So I think I think the intensity in this election is very high on both sides. Um, I feel like Joe Biden, though, has a he has a bit of a, a strong position on that because a um, the turnout. So the turnout modeling uh, certainly would benefit him if if more younger voters and more of the disaffected uh, voters who who are on quote unquote unreliable voters or I although I don't necessarily like that term because it's it's a bit blamey to people who 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 for for sometimes perfectly valid reasons struggle to to cast their ballots um so you know certainly it would benefit him if those if those people turned out but he has another advantage even if even in the absence of a high turnout model election which is that compared to other democrats um and certainly compared to recent democrats Biden is performing extremely well with seniors, older voters, who are the most reliable voters in, 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 the, in the sample, right? So he, he is performing much, much better with older voters. In fact, he's beating Trump amongst voters 65 plus. Um, I have to say the only generation that isn't reliably voting for Biden, Biden in, the, in the polling is my own. It's so Generation X, shame on you. Um, shame on us. Um, but seniors who are reliable voters are skewing, skewing Biden in this election. Um, and even things like white working class voters who um, in 2016 made all the difference for Trump are skewing a little bit more Biden friendly this time. And those that aren't skewing Biden, that demographic tends to be lower participation voters as well. So it's not necessarily clear um, you know, that, that Biden even needs necessarily a huge turnout over and above kind of yeah. 2018's modeling. You know, if you, if you extrapolate that to what yeah. a presidential model would look like, we'd still be in pretty good shape. Yeah. And and the that issue that I mentioned earlier that may drive up turnout even more is the Supreme Court. <clears throat> so let's see how well I know my American politics here. <laughs> uh, but for again, for listeners who are not who are wisely not so familiar with the details of US post boxes and politics. And um, the Supreme Court has nine justices and they are appointed for life and the president nominates somebody and then the Senate has to vote to approve the nomination. And the US Supreme Court has a lot more power in practice than say the British Supreme Court. And the British Supreme Court has made well, a couple of court rulings in the last, you know, in the last year that very much grabbed the headlines, but they were very much the exception. On the other hand, you know, the future of, for example, healthcare provision in the US is quite dependent on what the Supreme Court rules or indeed the future of uh, provision, you know, the legality or not of abortion is again very heavily dependent on the Supreme Court. So it has a lot more political power. And with the, the vacancy that tragically has just come up, if Trump fills it, that will be three out of the nine Supreme Court justices that will have been filled by Trump. And so what happens to the Supreme Court is a really big deal in that respect, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so before we go into that, I, I just want to pause and say Ruth Bader Ginsburg, mm. the justice who recently passed, was an, an icon. And, you know, um, mm. to, to me and to many of us, I think, was a real hero and a, a role model. Um, and to many, especially, I think, young women in the country, she she was just a pathbreaker, um, mm. you know, and she was, you know, uh, just just to pause for a moment on, mm. on her life and career. She she argued six cases in front of the Supreme Court before becoming a justice as a lawyer each of which were um, history, history making um, cases to do with gender, uh, gender equity. And mm -hmm. she, she successfully implemented a strategy that, that effectively secured equal treatment for women under the law, mm -hmm. um, even to the extent of, you know, at the time that she started working on those things, women couldn't hold bank accounts in their own names without their husband's signature. They couldn't, um, they couldn't acquire, uh, you know, get a divorce. They couldn't get equal pay for their work. T so issue after issue, she, she was a real, really smart, tactical but strategic um strategically effective advocate for um both for women but also for like equal treatment under the law and uh so you know not only do i regret her passing from political <laughs> point of view but yeah. i i think we should just pause and and reflect on the fact that you know her her life was was of note right and was yeah absolutely yes. and and it, it's interesting that she achieved all of those things as a lawyer arguing in front of courts mm. in the, I mean, I, I don't think there's any British figure who 
really remotely compares to her in terms of that breadth of achievement. But I guess Roy Jenkins, perhaps in terms of his tenure as Home Secretary, if you look think about the number of liberalising reforms mm. that he you know oversaw, and that sort of captures, I think, the difference and the importance of the Supreme Court. That in the UK, the equivalent would be somebody who is a been a cabinet minister or prime minister and introduced a set of path-breaking legal changes in the US. An awful lot of that actually comes not from changing the law in terms of legislation. It comes from changing the law by winning key court cases, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, although of course, think, of course, uh, the purists would say that the law is not being changed. The law, is yeah, I was going to say covered. it's not a change in the law. It is, <laughs> um, but I think I think the difference the difference boils down to a lot of things. Um, part of which has to do with there are significantly more veto points in in mm. American politics. So, um, in UK UK politics, if you're in government and you want to change something, you just change it, right? Yeah. Whereas in we need US... more veto points. <laughs> 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 that, basically, we need to shift some veto points from US politics to British politics, and both. Yeah, we need fewer and maybe you need more so we could just equalize that um so as a result the courts have become a a, a really important in that um uh, but but the other thing is just the role of the constitution of course we have a written constitution and the supreme court's function is to interpret that constitution and because constitutional interpretation almost has you know like any literary theory (laughs) you can almost treat it like you know it goes through waves of you know there are there are strict constructionists and then there are people who interpret the constitution in a more broad way um and and ruth bader ginsburg was definitely someone who um, saw the Constitution as establishing certain fundamental and basic rights and, um, you know, saw saw it as her role to protect those core core rights that were at the heart of the Constitution. Um, So anyway, your original question, I think, was about the politics of this. Um, um, And and they are fascinating because for a generation, certainly for most of my lifetime, it has been kind of just understood by most people that the um, it was Republican voters who were most energized by trying to move the court. Now, there was a narrative that during the 1960s and 70s and into the 80s, the court had been very liberal minded. And there was an active effort by um, people on the right to try and try try and shift that. So they've been starting to move judges up, really advocate for more um, right leaning political, explicitly political judges and moving them slowly up the system through appellate courts and so forth. And 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 ultimately, they're they're, they were very, very motivated to do what they've done, which is secure a majority on the Supreme Court. It should be said they've secured a majority on the Supreme Court of you know what would be six to three should trump get his nominee appointed despite having only won the popular vote in one of the last six elections so (laughs) one of the last seven yeah 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 so so you know it is the democratic legitimacy of it is is troubling um But and I think because of that, there has been more recently since the 2016 Mm. election, I think Democrats have have awoken to um, their concern about the courts. And in 2016, I was just looking at some polling for my own podcast in 2016, uh, uh, more Republicans than Democrats cited the Supreme Court as a as a motivating factor for their vote. Really? How interesting. In, in 2020, more Democrats than Republicans are citing the Supreme Court. So this in the most recent polling that I think Pew just conducted, it's 66 percent of Democrats say the Supreme <laughs> Court is a motivating factor and 60 percent of Republicans. So it's 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 flipped a little bit. Mm. Um, which just means that the the stakes are just enormous for this nomination. And I think Trump will try and push it through as quickly as he can. Um, and I think Mitch McConnell, who's the, the, the leader in the Senate, will also try and push it through as quickly as he can. It, however, might cost them their Senate majority because the Senate is, we've talked about the presidential race, but the Senate is on a knife edge as well. Um, and although Democrats have quite a hurdle to, to mm. climb in that we need to we need to gain, I think, four or five seats, depending on whether we take the presidency to take the Senate, because the vice president mm-hmm. breaks the tie. So, yeah. procedural thing there. Um, so we've got to we've got to gain quite a few seats before we can um, before we can take take back the Senate. But a lot of the seats that we need to claim are in states that are purplish, mm-hmm. um, not necessarily strong Republican states, and where I think the the impact of the Supreme Court could actually work in our favor um, politically. And- if if an if a appointment to Supreme Court goes through, 
but Biden wins the presidency. I mean, that will produce a real dilemma as to how radical or not to be in response. Because one of the, you know, well, the two threats the Democrats are talking about at the moment is one is that the size of the Supreme Court can just be legislated for. Yep. So you can say, well, okay, we're going to make the Supreme Court 13 in size and we're going to appoint another four. Uh, maybe Democrat leaning, uh, liberal leaning justices, but also the Democrats could, if they were in control of Congress as well, they could threaten to do things like give statehood to Washington DC and Puerto Rico, which would mean four more people, people in, in the Senate and those both of those places would be most likely to elect Democrats to those. Yeah. But that would be, I think that the possibility that that's the sort of choice Biden may have to contemplate, I think really highlights the very moderate pitch he's making for president at the moment. Mm -hmm that he really seems to be going for the, you know what, we just all need to calm down a bit. We need to be a bit more reasonable. We need to yeah. just, which as an alternative to, to Trump, you know, has a lot of appeal. It certainly wins me over. Um, and But I guess comes with two risks. One is what happens further down the route, road, you know, if he wins and if the Democrats have control of Congress that you've made, he's maybe not got a mandate for radical reform then. But also, it's exactly the sort of approach which, when it wins, everyone calls the candidate and the campaign manager absolute geniuses. But when you take that approach and lose, everyone castigates them for being utter fools and completely failing to be distinctive <laughs> and to mobilise their base and all of that. And, I, I'm, and I'm reminded, actually, of how the Australian Labour Party in that respect that the Australian Labour Party has gone sometimes for that small target approach of trying yeah. to minimise your difference, and it's gone really badly. And sometimes, they, uh, particularly with Kevin Rudd in 2007, they went for that approach and it worked really well and it was genius. Um, obviously, I hope it's going to be genius this time, but what's your, what's your take on the, the, the thinking behind that approach of the Biden campaign and whether it's helping or hindering his chances of victory? So there's a, there's a lot in that <laughs> that I would love to respond to. Um, okay, so first of all, I would just the the Biden approach to the election has been guided by a couple of factors. One is, and it's it's hard. This is the hardest election conundrum that I think we've ever faced because normally at this point in the cycle, we would be conducting huge in person events. We would be doing enormous amounts of door knocking and face to face voter contact, and the presidential like so the the candidates schedule would be based around trying to have as many touch points with as many voters as possible, you know, whether not only through events, but through like getting in the local news so that you show up in someone's local newspaper, not just national news, all these kinds of things. And because of COVID and because Biden is trying to represent himself as, and, and in fact, to legitimately be <laughs> a responsible candidate who's not going to make anyone sick or risk the country. And because there's so much sensitivity around that, I think he's quite rightly taken the approach of we can't run a normal campaign yeah. and that's and i don't know how to quantify the impact of that mm -hmm. um because normally if you told me all other factors being equal if you told me one candidate is holding in-person rallies and doing extensive extensive door knocking and one candidate is not i would consider that to be a disaster for the candidate who is not and I don't know how to quantify how that plays out in a world where voters will know that that is because the candidate is trying to keep them safe, mm. right? So it's really challenging to understand what all that means. I think the other factor, and this is why this election is just weird on every level, the other factor is Trump's ability to control the media narrative is unprecedented and not necessarily something we want to emulate or even necessarily challenge. Mm. Because when Trump is in the news more, mm. his poll numbers tend to go down. Mm. Um, so, you know, and you have to, you know, you have to look at every election on a case by case mm. basis, but, but Trump's, Trump's instinct is always to make everything about him and voters don't like that very much. So his, you know, the more he's in the media, the less he tends to, um, he, the less, the, 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 you know, the, his poll numbers tend to go down even slightly, even though it's a very stable race overall. 
So I'm not sure it's necessarily a good idea to challenge, uh, to try and, you know, when your enemy's making a mistake, don't interrupt him, mm. <laughs> as they say. Um, and then there's the other thing, which is, you know, if I'm being really candid, Joe Biden is a fantastic human being. Um, but he is somebody who, for all of his life, has had a tendency to put his foot in his mouth. And mm. I think Democrats are a little worried about yeah. overexposing him, um, you know, pushing him into a point where he does start making mistakes. And suddenly that's the story. Right now, he's very careful. He's very measured. He, you know, he does, you know, he isn't avoiding the press by any means. He does media events every day, but he keeps them very focused on the states he wants to win. They don't try and do kind of big, splashy national. They don't try and raise controversy or any of that. And I think from a candidate point of view, that's probably better for Joe Biden because he can have a tendency, having watched him in the past, he can have a tendency to sometimes lose his cool when he's under pressure or, you know, we've seen him during the primary, he kind of, you know, Got, got frustrated with a voter sometimes in voter conversations. I don't think it's a good idea to press him into the situation where he might make a flub like that. So yeah. there's a lot of factors going on. And I guess the it's three presidential debates, isn't it, that we're going to have, three televised presidents. I mean, they will be fascinating in that respect because I can imagine that, you know, if, if, if a candidate, if a Democrat candidate really wanted to get under Trump's skin, you know, there's a take, for example, the news recently about the TikTok uh, deal, where basically Trump has has utterly failed to achieve anything that he, you know, he claimed he wanted uh, in that deal. And you, you you can imagine in something like a debate format, it could be a really effective way of riling Trump, you know, to to mock, you know, this great deal maker. Actually, you know, the Chinese walked all over in the negotiations and so on. Um, but that would be a very different style from the, the style that Biden is taking. But I can see how, you know, Biden might just come over as being, to borrow a Trump phrase when he was attacking somebody else, you know, very low wattage. You know, he, he can't just appear to be a bit sort of dull and distant and not that passionate in those debates. I, I'm really, oh, I, it's really I, fascinating to see what approach Biden takes in those debates. I will be very surprised if Trump, if if Biden comes out with the low watted style that you describe mm. in the debates. I think he is chomping at the bit to take on Trump face to face. Um, and I will say, actually, I'll be honest. You know, as as those who are long term followers of my podcast will know, I I started covering the race early in the primary, partly because I was very interested in the conversation mm. we were having as a party. And I, I was very unimpressed by Biden's early debate performances. I was mm. like extremely unimpressed to the point of, I am very concerned that he is leading in the polls because he is not doing yeah. well. Um, and, you know, he really, he, he struggled. He was, he was a little bit, you know, he would, he, he would run short of time and then he would just be, sort of fade off. Mm. Um, but, but that's not a static phenomenon. He got better. Mm. And, and I think this is a, a kind of little discussed phenomenon. It is common for people, you know, it, a, a common problem for people who have been president, you know, Ob Biden, o Obama in his uh, first 2012 debate did perform very badly against Romney because when you're out of practice in the debate format, um, it can be really challenging. So I actually think it's a really, it is an advantage for Biden that he had, I mean, they did so many debates. I think there were about nine or 10 democratic debates, um, including, you know, the final one, which is the only head to head debate that uh, Biden had was directly against Bernie Sanders one-on-one -on -one and was probably his best debate. He, he was probably the strongest. Um, so I think he will go in very aggressive with Trump. And I think that the fact that he's had some experience of debating recently um, will be will be good. Um, I think people are very worried because not because they necessarily expect Biden to do badly in the debates, but just because there are so few opportunities between now and Election Day for Trump to change the dynamic of this race. And the debates are one of those. So as you, you know, that the old rule of thumb in politics is if if you're in the lead, you want fewer debates mm -hmm. because want to change anything just keep going if you're behind you want more debates so you can try and mix things up um so that's the risk there i but i would expect Biden to be exceptionally prepared i mean he yeah. takes this very very seriously um and i think he's eager to take on trump one-to-one -one. although as you say if he goes into the debates you know ahead in the polls and maybe playing safe is the right tactic you know just because you just you want to you know a, a draw as a win if you're if you if you're starting ahead you don't have to win the debate. You can even lose the debate slightly 
and then that's another event out the way another day closer to polling day um so yeah i don't i yeah. don't know i think i think it depends well, well we will soon know we will yeah soon it depends know how, what safe how, is right yeah. like what's what's safe <laughs> i think it would be i think it would be a mistake not to be appear not to appear to be challenging trump to some extent yeah. because i think that's what biden's voters want right yeah. if he's you know, and not just not just necessarily his core voters, but swing voters too. You know, they're deeply concerned. They will want to see that someone is out there challenging Trump directly, and that you know they're taking the case to him. So I think that's. Um, I, I would I would suspect it's probably not safe to be too quiet. And and also, I guess the Democrats are fairly split on a whole load of policy areas, aren't they? That that in a way, and maybe not massively, you know, split compared to what is relatively normal. But if you think about what are maybe the big policy areas otherwise, like on health care, mm. or on for Democrat leaning voters, you know, tackling environmental issues, there are there is quite a range of views in the Democrats. As what should be. So in a way for Biden, making it about personality and not policies, you know, I'm not Trump is is the safer more unifying ground because once yeah. you get into talking about say healthcare, you much more quickly get into uh, universal payer and other 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 issues where there is you know the the, the uh, gap between the views of um say a typical biden supporter and a typical bernie sanders supporter in the primaries was quite notable yeah i think i think it's i think trump biden's in a fantastic position yeah. on policy actually because Two things. First of all, he has positioned himself as the moderate candidate, right? Mm. So by being the, the the most moderate Democrat who is, you know, who a prominent Democrat who is running in the primary, he has branded himself as that. So it's going to be hard. I mean, Trump has been trying to say that Biden is, you know, a um, you know, secret closet socialist and all these things. And it's just laughable because people know that's not who Joe Biden is. It's just not. Yeah. And, um, and on the, you know, to translate socialist into English politics speaks, that means being <laughs> Ken Clark. You know, Ken yes, Clark would exactly. be a socialist in US politics, <laughs> exactly. wouldn't he? <laughs> um, but I think one of the one of the things that is happening under the radar, which I'm happy is happening under the mm. radar because it's it's kind of an inter-party conversation mm. for us to have, right? Has been there's been a significant evolution of Biden's policy policy making in the Sanders direction since the since the primary his right. climate change his climate change policy is much more um, bold certainly than what he was originally proposing um, he has moved although he hasn't adopted single payer health care he has moved his health care plan considerably more in the direction of you know a, a, a bigger public option for health care etc so um, there has actually been a significant move on policy more in the direction of where a lot of the senders wing of the party has been pushing things certainly not you know fully everything that they want but there's been this unity coalition that he put together where they kind of there were working groups that went out between the Sanders and the and the Biden wings of the party and really formed some policy. And that's been very successful in terms of bringing the Sanders wing on board. And indeed, you know, the polling suggests that um, Sanders supporters had been holding back a little ways, but we are now very on track to to hold the Sanders voters together in our coalition in this election, which is crucially important. We, we need all of them. Yeah. And and again, I, I guess when when it comes to writing history books, the it will be easy to explain what has happened under a Biden presidency at the moment. You know, it looks like it could either be, well, the best way to be really radical is to clothe it in moderate garb to, mm. to win the election. Yeah, it it's a bit of an be... only Nixon can go to China strategy, yeah, right? Exa yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so who knows? Um, it's a good thing that all of these events are going to happen soon enough that we will <laughs> to know the answers. We will know. We I will. I would like to pick up on one thing you said mm. earlier, if I may. Um, mm. So you were talking about the Supreme Court and you were saying some of the options for you know what Democrats could do. Yeah. I just want to be clear. I do not think that we should quote unquote threaten mm. to make DC and Puerto Rico states as retaliation for the Supreme Court. I think we should just do that anyway. <laughs> 
<laughs> because, because it's the right thing to do. Because it is just the right thing to do, places, right? Yeah. And I, like, I, I'm a little, as a DC voter myself, I have strong feelings about this. So, you know, <laughs> forgive me for personalizing yeah. things a little bit. But, you know, in the District of Columbia alone, there are 700,000 voters who have no representation in Congress whatsoever. Mm-hmm. People who are deeply affected by the decisions that the federal government yeah. makes. In fact, more so than most citizens, mm-hmm. because they live in a city that is very much under federal control. Um, and to say that, you know, people like myself and citizens across the district, majority minority district, by the way, um, don't have the right to congressional representation, it's just untenable. And I don't think we should bargain that away. I think we should, if we take back the Senate and, 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 and continue to hold the House and take the presidency, I think we should just do it because it is the right thing to do. And if the Republicans don't like it, then too bad. <laughs> it's still the right thing to do. It would be like if in Britain, people who lived in the city of London or the or Westminster didn't have an MP. Exactly. But, you know, if you would, and you were just, well, you've got no representation in Parliament. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I suspect Puerto Rico and Northern Ireland would be a really bad parallel, but I guess that's sort of, <laughs> sort of the other, other, you know, would be the other equivalent, wouldn't it? It would be as yeah. if, you know, people in Northern Ireland could not send any MPs to, yeah. to Westminster yeah. Parliament at all. And I mean, the difference being, obviously, in Northern Ireland's case, there's a sizable minority who would be, who, who, who want a different, you know, a different future for Ireland, which that might be a step towards, whilst yeah. in Puerto Rico, uh, the political pressure is much more unified towards being wanting to be part of the US in that sense. Well, there is, there uh, is, in uh, fact... Uh, sorry, the US uh, political th- system in that I sense. mean, there is, a, there is, in fact, a big controversy in Puerto Rico. I mean, statehood is not universally popular there, and mm. most of Puerto Rico's pol- politics are, are along the axis mm. of statehood or no statehood, because there's a real debate in that. Mm. In the case of the District of Columbia, there is no debate. Mm. You know, most D.C. residents have voted in um, local, man- local referenda on the question of statehood, and I think by something like 90% majorities have have expressed their will to become a state so um it's just there's no if if it were not already the case it would never be acceptable to make it so it's just this status quo bias right where because it's always been we think it's normal but it's not normal and it's not right (laughs) yeah that well there's yeah there's a whole world of political pain behind the oh well of course everyone's used to it (laughs) exactly it covers a lot of sins we could talk a long time about other things that fall into that category but we should probably wrap things up so i won't force you to predict the presidential election but if any listeners do want to learn more about u.s politics is there anything you'd particularly recommend that they read listen or watch Yes. Um, so I'll give you some of the sources that I that I rely upon as my touchstone. So um, you'll probably, I'm sure, Mark, be aware of the work of f- the website 538. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Um, Nate Silver runs an excellent data based um, uh, website and, and they have a, a political politics podcast, which I also listen to, which is excellent, um, covering US politics from a really uh, a, an analytical political um, and, and sort of data driven perspective, which is really valuable. Um, I also strongly so I, I will often go to um, there's a website called Talking Points Memo, which covers um, US politics from a from more of a left leaning perspective, but tends to be again, they do great original reporting and they often will break stories that no one else has. So another fantastic poli- website to follow for for politics. Um, and then, you know, I think, um, you know, I subscribe to both the Washington Post and the New York Times, they both remain excellent papers. Um, the uh, particularly um, from a polling point of view, if you if you have an interest in sort of again the data centered side of things, Nate Cohn, who runs the the polling aspect of the of the New York Times, um, is a really great political analyst, yeah. and he has um, he has his own project and he runs his own polling, and and they do some wonderful in 2018 election they did some fantastic transparency around it, so they could you could watch them as they were conducting the poll and see every single call as it was made, and they really kind of opened opened the process out to those who are super, super nerdy like me to see um, how a poll is conducted and what kind of factors go into it. So if you're, if you're, like I say, an Uber nerd, which I venture to guess some of your listeners might be. Just some um, might be, just some (laughs) might be. And Nate Cohen and Nate Silver seem to have quite a sparky interaction at times. So, 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 so that can always be fun to look out for is the tweets back and forth. Absolutely. 
Um, excellent. Well, that is a really, really good set of recommendations. I will include links to all of them, as well as several other uh, of the things that we've talked about, including for anyone who wants to know more about that, Kevin Rudd, Australia 2007 Electoral Strategy. Uh, I think there was a book review I wrote many years ago about that, so I'll include a link to that as well. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Karen. Uh, anyone who also wants to hear more from Karen, don't forget to look in your podcasting app for Democratically 2020, the name of Karen's show, and you can find her on Twitter at Karen JR. Uh, that's K A R I N J R. You can find me on Twitter at Mark Pack and this podcast at Bar Chart Podcast. So thanks very much for joining me on this show, Karen. Thanks very much, everyone, for listening. Until next time.